welcome to the next lecture on Mendelian genetics. This will most likely be the last lecture on Mendelian genetics. We said that uh, many diseases are genetically linked and to usefully analyze such disease inheritance, we could use Mendelian principles. We showed some examples, we looked at some examples and then came to the situation of X linked disorders, the disorders that arise due to alleles that are uh, inherited from X linked chromosomes. We saw how the inheritance patterns could be different from those predicted by Mendelian principles and uh, I would say that you could work out this example and we would start this lecture by solving this example. This is uh, a, pet, a family tree, uh, parents and then the three offspring here, they marry and they have children and there is one more generation that is occurring here and after uh, mating here, there are uh, children here and we are trying to answer some questions related to these. The first question was, is the in inherited character dominant or recessive? is it autosomal or X linked? That is the um, first question. The second question was, if 3 is not a carrier as um, that is given, so, uh, probably the person has a genotypic analysis, uh, analysis results and now we know, we know that the 3 is not a carrier of the disease. If that is the case, what are the genotypes of 1 and 4? That is the second question. The last question was that, what is the probability that 14 is affected? So, let us look at how to solve this. As you can see, this disease misses a generation completely. 4, 5 and 7 who are offspring of 1 and 2, 2 has the disease is completely missed here. Okay. If it is dominant, then this kind of a missing will not arise because one of the, as long as one of the uh, genes is uh, dominant the uh, disorder will manifest. Therefore, it is most likely recessive, right, uh, since it has missed a generation that will happen only if it is a recessively inherited disorder. And if you see here, only males are affected, 2, 8 and 10 are affected, all are males and that will happen most likely if it is X linked. Okay. Therefore, it is a recessive disorder and it is most likely X linked. Now, let us try to answer this question. If 3 is not a carrier, what are the genotypes of 1 and 4? We know that it is a recessively inherited disorder and most likely X linked. So, let us work it out. This person has to be X capital A, X capital A or <coughs> a, a heterozygous person X capital A, X small a. The person is not showing. It is recessive. Therefore, even this um, kind of a genotype will not result in the disorder being manifest. And this is manifested here and it is X linked. Therefore, this has to have a recessive allele on the X for it to be manifest in this male here. Okay. So, it is X small a Y here. We are result, we are interested in 1 or 4, so far only uh, this 1 could either be this or this is what we can say. Let us look at 8 here. This is an affected person, therefore it has to be X affected male, therefore there has to be a Y chromosome and the it is X linked, therefore the, X, the uh, disease allele needs to be carried by X, X small a Y. We know that this person is not a carrier, therefore X capital A Y male and the possible this person is a female and not affected. Since it is a female, it has to be X X. Since the person is not affected and uh, the father is affected, this would be an X small a and the other one could uh, should be an X capital A from the mother. Okay. So, that is the 
genotype of 4. So, 1 we cannot say anything more than x capital A, x capital A, x capital A, x small a, it could be one of the two types, whereas 4 need, can be uh, or is x capital A, x small a. Okay, those are that is the answer to that question. Now, what is the probability that 14 is affected? 14 is here, therefore, we need to look at the parents here. This is a female, the mother is a, a female, therefore, it is x x and the mother is not affected, therefore, either both capitals homozygous or capital small heterozygous. In both cases, the person will not be affected. The father is affected and therefore, it has to be x small a y and therefore, the probability that this male will be affected x what y, the y is coming from the father and what is the probability that this would be a x small a, that is what we are asking. The probability that this will be an x small a depends on the probability that the mother is a carrier. Okay. Uh, therefore, it is something like this, probability that the mother is a carrier times the pr probability that x a goes to 14 or uh, this has become x a. Uh, the person as has inherited the x a from the mother. Okay. Uh, the probability that 9 is a carrier, see for example, if the mother is not a carrier, then the mother is um, x a x a, right? x capital A x capital A, then 14 will not be affected at all. Okay, because y comes from the father, this x a does not matter. So, the y will be affected only if the affected allele comes from the mother, this x small a. So, it is the probability that 9 is a carrier and x a goes to 14. Probability that 9 is a carrier is half, okay, these are the two possibilities and one of which is we are considering and the probability of x small a going to 14 when x capital A is also there is another half and therefore, the, prob the probability that 14 will be affected, 14 will have the genotype x small a y is half into half that is one fourth. Okay. So, that is the answer to the question. I am sure many of you have the right answer, you can check this. Let us finish up with what we said earlier. The Mendelian principles as we know have uh, limitations, we cannot apply it uh, blindly to everything, but we can apply it to a large number of diseases that show Mendelian inheritance. Okay. That was the use of learning Mendelian principles. There are a lot of non-Mendelian inheritances, please check out the video that is given here. The first non-Mendelian principle that we are going to look at is that dominance is not always excuse me absolute a spectrum exists it's not either purple flowers or white flowers okay. there is something in between also that could arise it does not happen in the pea plant but it happens in many other things that is called incomplete dominance or co-dominance is a variant of that and there could be very low frequency of the dominant allele that we have already seen. This is slightly different from what we expect, that is the reason why I have put it down as uh, something that is different from expected, it does not go with the other two. Uh, we have already seen this in the case of Huntington's disease, uh, the very low frequency of the dominant allele. Uh, as long as you have the dominant allele, you are going to get the disease, but the presence of the dominant allele itself uh, has a very low frequency in the population. Okay. So, that is what this means. So, this is uh, uh, not always absolute a spectrum such as this exists from incomplete dominance to co-dominance to complete dominance. An example of incomplete dominance is, is something like this. In the case of a different plant, the if you take true breeding red and white flowers and uh, cross them together, the gametes would be capital R and capital W. In the F1 generation, all the flowers would be pink, somewhere in between red and white. Okay. So, it is neither red nor white, 
C R C C capital R C capital W has resulted in a pink flower, no longer a red flower. And this is an example of incomplete dominance. You take this further, you have uh, the gametes from the F1 generation as C capital R, C uh, capital W, half and half. And then if you do a Punnett uh, square analysis, one fourth would be red, half would be pink and one fourth would be white in the F2 generation. This is an example of incomplete dominance is, which is different from that predicted from Mendelian principles. Very low frequency of the dominant allele, we have already seen the example. One more example is polydactyly, more than 5 digits in a hand or a foot. Okay, it occurs in about 1 in 1000 birds across the world. It is the dominant allele, one allele being present is sufficient to exhibit polydactyly. But we know that uh, a majority is, are not poly, polydactyl, right. So, dominancy, dominance does not mean a majority, not always. So, that is something that we need to keep in mind. Similarly, achondroplasia, a type of dwarfism, results from a dominant allele again. In India, about 1 in 15,000 have this achondroplasia. In the US, about 1 in 400 have achondroplasia. And double recessive alleles are most commonly found in the population, because if one allele had been dominant, the achondroplasia would have set in. Whereas, we know that only 1 in 15,000 are uh, have that disease, which means most in the population do not have uh, rather they have recessive alleles, they have they do not even have one of the dominant alleles. This is the very low frequency of the dominant allele. We have already seen an example of Huntington's disease earlier. The next non Mendelian aspect is that multiple alleles can determine a trait, okay, not just two, multiple alleles. For example, it is a very good example that of blood groups we all know. We know that there are four major blood groups, what A, B, A, B and O, right. And of course, R is positive, R is negative, we will leave that aside for the time being. We know that uh, there are A, B, A, B and O and this is determined by three alleles, okay. Three alleles A cap, uh, capital A, capital B and nothing at all and written uh, with a small i. I capital A, I capital B and small i, let me uh, name it that way. These determine the blood group as follows. The A type results, if it is either I capital A, I capital A or I capital A small i. Okay. If it is, uh, it is a B group, if it is I capital B, I capital B or I capital B small i. And if it is A B, if it is I A, I B both capitals and if it is O when neither A nor B are present or in other words small i, small i. These are the alleles. In terms of what actually happens, uh, this A and B refer to carbohydrates on the surface of RBCs, A and B are different carbohydrates. An I uh, A uh, or an A carbohydrate is represented by a maroon circle, a B carbohydrate by or a red circle, B carbohydrate by a blue circle and if there are no carbohydrates, neither A nor B, then it is small i. So, if this is the red blood cell, a disc shaped red blood cell, if it has all um, A carbohydrates being expressed then it is blood group A. If it is all B carbohydrates being expressed, it is blood group B. If it is both A and B carbohydrates being expressed, it is A B. And if none are present, it is group O. Okay. And this is also an example of what is called co-dominance, where both A and B are expressed, are shown, are, are showing up simultaneously. Okay. That is what is called co-dominance, which is again a difference from the Mendelian inheritance. Pleiotropy is again non-Mendelian. This means that the same gene affects many characters, not just one. It, uh, it affects multiple phenotypes. An example is uh, from this, the same gene 
causes symptoms associated with sickle cell disease as well as cystic fibrosis. Okay. You can look at the video that is given here, the last video that is shown, uh, that will give you some more details about pleiotropy. Epistasis, which is the expression of a phenotype due to a gene at a locus, I mean uh, epistasis arises when the expression of a phen phenotype due to a gene at a locus is dependent on another gene at another locus. Okay. Expression of one is dependent on the other. If that happens, then it is called epistasis and again this is clearly non-Mendelian. This happens. Example is the color of fur it could either be black which arises from a dominant B capital B or brown from a double recessive uh, small b. But the color of fur is determined whether the color itself is expressed or not, okay. whether the color will be deposited in the fur or not. If it is deposited then again it is dominant if it is not deposited, it would be recessive, double recessive, homozygous recessive. So, the not only what color it is, whether the color will be deposited in the fur, both determine whether uh, the uh, animal turns out to be black, the animal fur turns out to be black or brown or no color at all, white maybe. This is an example of uh, such a cross. Okay. In other words, you could analyze this using a dihybrid kind of dihybrid cross situation. If you do a dihybrid between color and expression of that color, okay, whether the deposit, whether the color is deposited, as shown by this E, then this kind of a Punnett square results from these two uh, characters for these two aspects or these two characters, and both those characters together determine whether the color is seen ultimately in the dog or not. For example, in this case uh, 9 would have the color, 3 will not have the color, 9 would have 9 would be black and 3 would not have the color at all whereas 4 would be brown, the dominant recessive and no color at all. Right? So, this is different from the classic Mendelian Punnett square for two characteristics. Polygenic inheritance is another variant again from Mendelian inheritance, where multiple genes determine the expression of a character. The skin color is determined by three genes. The human height is again a good example of polygenic inheritance where multiple genes determine the height of a person and therefore, uh, there is a smooth variation, there is a continuous variation in heights, in skin color and so on and so forth because multiple genes uh, are determining this. In the case of skin color, it is three genes. This is a Punnett square which shows a trihybrid cross. As you could see, at least seven different possibilities exist, no color at all when everything is recessive here and then 6 by 64 of this color, 15 by 64 of a slightly darker shade, 20 by 64 of a darker shade, 15 by 64 of a darker shade. Uh, this can be obtained if you do, if you go through the various uh, numbers of uh, the blue, bluely shaded stars that are given here that would directly show the intensity of the color here. And as you go along, the intensity increases 15 by 64 higher intensity, 6 by 64 even higher and 1 by 64 the darkest, the darkest possible here that arises if all these 6 are of a certain kind. Okay. So, these are the various phenotypes, the number of dark skinned alleles and so on and so forth, where 3 different genes determine the skin color. The last thing that we are going to see is that even the environment could have an impact on the phenotype, okay. not just the gene, the environment in which the gene is expressed could have uh, an impact. For example, nutrition affects height. The height could be determined by uh, a number of genes, but whether the person grows up to the height potential determines on the nutrition. Right? So, the environment is determining the height. The exercise affects the looks, maybe you are born with the looks, but you need to exercise to reach the potential in terms of the looks. 
experience helps intelligence and so on. The pictorial example that I have here is the color of a hydrangea flower. It could either be this color or this color depending on the acidity level of the soil. Okay. Nothing else, it is the same gene, same expression and so on and so forth, but which color is expressed determined is determined by its environmental condition in this case the soil acidity. I think that is uh, good enough basal information. Uh, in terms of whatever we looked at um, after an introduction, we looked at um, biomolecules in terms of stories and so on just to make sure it is just not a set of information. Uh, we saw that there were four major biomolecules, carbohydrates, proteins or amino acids, whichever you want to call it, then nucleic acids, lipids and each one has their own structure uh, and the structure determines its function and so on and so forth. Uh, th that was the major take home lesson from that particular set of lectures on biomolecules. And we also looked at cell growth, why is it important to quantify cell growth. In, by cell growth, we mean the population growth, the uh, number of cells or the mass of cells increasing, mass of cells per unit volume, number of cells per unit volume increasing with time. Okay. How do you go about quantifying that? You can do that using a first order relationship and how you could use that to find out the time for operation of a bioreactor that also we saw. And then uh, some principles of Mendelian genetics. Uh, the Mendelian genetics that were developed a long time ago, it uh, was given as a part of, an, uh, of a basic course because although they were developed a long time ago, they are simple enough to be easily used to predict the occurrence of certain genetic disorders. After that we saw uh, some variations such as X-linked inheritance of disorders and the um, non Mendelian inheritance characteristics, very many different kinds of those. Okay. Uh, you could uh, look at this in association with what you pick up from Dr. Madhulika Dekshit's lectures and that would give you some basis on the molecular aspects of biology which you could apply to uh, your own requirements later to address your own challenges later. At least you have been exposed to this, you know where to go and pick up more information, uh, more specific information as and when the need arises. Okay. One last thing I would like to leave you with this thought to tell you the level of complexity that we are dealing with even in understand, understanding the cell completely. Once we understand the cell completely, then possibly the manipulations aspects can get more rigorous and we have come to a stage where you could manipulate life. But um, to give you an idea of the complexity that is involved, let me just show you this. I am sure you watched the video from Nature Publishing, uh, which was on the Human Genome Project, which showed that the information in the DNA is transcribed to the information in the mRNA, which gets translated to the information in the proteins. Okay. And that is actually called the central dogma, as you already uh, know by now. And we are so interested in proteins because they are important molecular workhorses in the cell. They do a lot of things in the cell. Each biomolecule is very important and uh, there is, there could be uh, more of a focus on proteins because it does so many things that are very apparent, that uh, are the basis of things that are very apparent. Okay. Let us look at some issues. When the DNA project, DNA uh, sorry, when the human genome project was uh, initiated, the initial thought was since DNA leads to proteins, if we know the complete DNA or the genome as it is called, we know the cell. Okay. This was a genomics view of this cell. If you know the blueprint, we know the cell. Okay. That was the thinking and that was uh, the motivation behind knowing the entire genome structure of humans which we came to know about 15 years ago. However, we were in for a lot of surprises. Humans had only 20 to 25,000 genes, okay, that is from this site, uh, 
20 to 25,000 genes. Whereas even a pesky mosquito has about 13,683 genes, okay, not, not uh, far apart from humans as we thought. And not just that, rice has 60,000 genes and there goes the concept of uh, us being superior, right. <laughs> this has three times the number of, approximately three times the number of genes that we do, or two and a half to three times. Okay. So, we can say that if we assume that we are the most complex, I, I am not very sure about that, but if we assume that we are the most complex. We can say that the complexity is not explained by genome size, right. Then people started thinking if we know the complete set of mRNA because DNA information goes to mRNA information they, through transcription. So, if you know the complete mRNA information which is called the transcriptome which can be done through microarray analysis and so on, then we know the cell. And if you know the complete set of proteins, the proteome we know the cell. If you know the complete set of metabolic reactions that the proteins um, catalyze through enzymes and so on and so forth, we know the cell because there are so many interactions that are taking place and so on. And this can go on and on, okay. the level of interactions between these various kinds are so many. So, when can we understand the cell really? That is the question, we do not really know. Also, interactions between individual units say proteins amongst proteins itself is one, protein DNA okay, or protein something else or maybe carbohydrate something else and so on or reactions that, that occur in the cell. And uh, do these units function under energy minimum conditions unlikely right and are there higher level interactions? Yeah, definitely there are and how do you go about understanding those. And as we speak people are working on all these things hopefully sometime in the future we will have a better understanding of the cell and therefore, a better understanding of life itself. Hope that you enjoyed this course, uh, there will be a few more lectures that come up in terms of which takes or which throws light on some of these aspects such as uh, DNA, the uh, processes related to DNA and so on, um, wish you had fun.